Okay, this is going to be fun. All right. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm so thankful that I get to come and, and hang out with you guys. And I had three plane rides to get here today, left early this morning, and I'm three hours behind. But really, it's three hours later where I came from. And so it's almost, I don't know what time it is, but it's later. But my heart is to really, 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 really go after the reality. See, I've been a Christian nine years, go after the reality of identity. I don't ever want to preach anything else. I don't, I don't believe there is anything else because I believe everything should be in there, encased in who I am before my father. Because whether, I, I just came back from Africa. I was just over there and did a, uh, I did my first, I, I was along for my first crusade with the ministry of Reinhard Bunke. And, and it was, I can't even explain it to you, except for, wow. But my heart is to always be, be before an audience of one every day, regardless of how many people I'm in front of. Because it's not about how many people out there, it's about this right here. Okay, let's just read a little. And then we'll go from there. Cool? I got the mic. You guys are good with that, right? All right. You guys are, you guys are here. Let's just, like, grow in some stuff here. All right. First off, um, I want to go to Romans 12. And just hang there for just, I'm going to go over a scripture in there, two scriptures or so. And then I want to move around the word a little. And I want to hit on some stuff. And then I just want to share my heart with you. How many of you came and aren't Christians? Come on, man. Don't be a chicken. Raise your hand. How many of you came here but you're not Christians? One? That's it? Come on, man. You guys be bold. You can't. You, you. All right. Two? Who else? Come on. Really? I bet you're bold when you talk to your friends and say that you're not a Christian. Why don't you be bold right now? Tell me. Dude, for real, if you, if you came here because you just come to the conference, like someone got you here somehow, whatever, you're just like, whatever. If you're that whatever person, raise your hand. Come on. All right, I got a couple. Yeah, all right, good. Good for you. Welcome. Are any, anybody a witch? You came here and you're a witch? Are you really? Yes, for real? Oh, I just want to hug you. You have no idea. I so love that. Is there anybody that's like a Wiccan that came tonight? We never start out a meeting like this. What's this? <laughs> this is just like asking questions. Come on. If you are a witch and you came here, you came to the right place. I promise. I'm doing that because I can't hardly see you. But yeah, all right, so welcome. I feel like there is one that is in that and practice that and you're in for a very, very fun time. You're in for a treat. I encourage you to keep coming back because Jesus is amazing and he really loves you. And like, and, and real serious, like he's like, he's the bomb. And if you walked and Jesus was around, you'd be like, I'm hanging with you. Really? And, and, and. You just would. I, I travel all over the world to get to speak to all kinds of different New Agers and witches and all that. Man, I just came from a corn concert, com concert a couple of months ago, and that's pretty dark, and it was pretty fun. We just had so much fun. Okay, sorry. All right. Yeah. Nah. Gosh. Okay. I said Romans, right? Sorry. Bear with me, guys. Father, I just thank you in Jesus' name, God. Name above all names. Like, I don't have to pray for principalities to be pulled down because he's the head of all. So, it doesn't matter. God, I thank you that I don't even have to pray for an open heaven because I am one. Because you're awesome. 
You open the heavens through righteousness, and I just believe. And so I live and walk as an open heaven, and God, I thank you that you would empower all people to walk in that same thing. But God, I thank you so much that you would make your word alive and real, because it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides, divides and separates the soul from the spirit. So God, to me, that means that it separates the way that seems right to a man from my spirit man, and it will cut right through, slice and dice all the lies. God, I thank you that you would give us the renewal of the mind. Father, I thank you that a real quick work, God, that people that didn't understand would say, what is the deal? I get it. God, thank you that the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you would come and just cut right through all the trash and get rid of all that garbage, God. We'd surround every lie with so much truth that it couldn't survive anymore. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Ah. God is really, 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 really in a good mood. I'm so serious, man. I believe in Christ that you don't have a right to be a have a bad day. Like Jesus had like a couple. Like, I mean, think about it. He's holy and perfect and beautiful. He comes here and came to his own and they knew him not. I mean, the light of the world, man. In him was the light of men. And he came to this world to redeem us because God loved us. But not just to redeem me to the place where I just get to heaven, but to redeem me to a place where that fallen nature, that sin nature, that thing that makes me want to do stuff that's twisted would get completely crushed and grafted out of me to where I would only want to live and please my father. That's like pretty amazing. But he came into this world holy and beautiful and lovely and they like ripped his flesh apart strung him up on a tree, hung him there, and he says things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Holiness and beauty and awesomeness, man. I mean, if anybody had the right to have a bad day, it probably would have been Jesus. Think it with me, man. If anybody had the right to have a bad day, it would have been him. I mean, he came to his own. They knew him not. He's like, he grows up. And, and like he grows up as a man, he's tempted at all points, he never sins, never ever ever misses it. His soul is perfect and holy and beautiful. He's tempted at all points, yet never misses it. And he didn't do it for himself, he did it for us. And then, as he's doing it for us, we hang him on a tree. Come on man, Jesus, on the tree. I'm out of here, forget it. You want me to die for them? No way, I'm out. No one can picture him saying that, yet that's in our mouth all the time. And Jesus had the most right to have a bad day. I mean, have attitude. He had no attitude, man. He was love in action. He came and he did it all because he so loved us, man. God so loved me that he sent his son that when I was twisted and whacked and bent and ripping people off and a thief and horrible, horrible dad, man, destroying my daughter's life, Jesus said, I want that one. I didn't deserve it. It's not about what I deserve. If I got what I deserve, I'd be in hell. If you get what you deserve, you'll be in hell too. So when you get in a bad day and an attitude, be careful. Come on, man. Gosh. It's not okay to like not be really, really, really thankful in your life. Because thankfulness is everything. Because you don't have any idea what you really have. I mean, I, I tell my kids, I raise them every day, just talking to them about thankfulness and be thankful because it, it just doesn't matter what. It's a thankful, a thankful place. It's the will of God for you in everything to give thanks. It is God's will for you to always be thankful and in all things pray. It's, it's God's will. God's will is for you to be thankful constantly. Romans 1, 16. Like, you guys ever heard of Lecrae? Yeah? Like the 116 click, all that? Yeah? Romans 1.16, can I come around? Can I walk around? Yeah, freedom. <laughs> Romans 1.16 is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation for them that believe, first for the Jew and then for the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. He's unashamed, unashamed. And then right after that, it goes on to say about thankfulness. And it says that although they knew God, they, they failed to give thanks. And their thoughts became futile. 
And all of a sudden, it got twisted up here. So when we live in a place of unthankfulness, it twists the mind, it twists the soul. Your mind gets weirded out and starts to think bad stuff constantly. And then you can't be thankful. And then you live like the Israelites lived in a place where they crossed over the Red Sea and they came out of Egypt. Moses let them out. They come out of there, and it would have taken, I think, what, 11 days for them to get to where they needed to go? But because they weren't thankful, and they complained, and they criticized, and they gossiped, and they grumbled, it took 40 years. And that's a horrible place for anybody to be. So Jesus is like the most amazing, amazing picture of what a man or a woman of God could be. And Jesus goes into a wilderness that's similar to the Israelites' wilderness, except he went in selfless, they went in selfish. So we have to be thankful, man. Man, you have a lot to be thankful for. You wake up in the morning, and this might, if I could teach you anything from the whole conference, if, if you leave with one thing, it's to be thankful, to have an amazing intimacy with God, to have a prayer life that's just you and your Father. Because we can't elevate gifting and impartation at the cost of our personal revelation of God and our relationship with Christ. We can't afford to press into gifting and signs and wonders more than we can our intimate relationship with our Father. And if there's one thing that I've held strong on and, and hold strong constantly is my relationship with my dad. So whether I'm doing a miracle or whether I'm prophesying over somebody or giving a word of knowledge or, or just helping somebody or buying somebody's lunch, the reality of that always is a byproduct of my intimate relationship between me and my Father. And thankfulness will put you outside of, outside of intimacy. Then you'll start to gain who you are through what you do because you can still do the miracles. You can still heal the sick without a thankful heart, man. And you'll gain who you are through what you do and then you'll live to be thanked rather than to live to give thanks. Oh, that's good. You'll, you'll start to gain appreciation through people saying, wow, man, did you heal my friend? Well, you know, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. That's how it starts. And then it's like, well, well, can you pray for this one? Well, well yeah, okay. Bang. All of a sudden, God touches them. Oh, wow. Man, you're like Superman. You're like super Christian. Hey, can you pray for my other? Hey, can you pray? And then all of a sudden, you've gained this thing through the thankful heart of people that are thanking you, but you really didn't stay in a place of thankfulness between you and God, and it's become all about you instead of your relationship. And the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, so he won't pull back the reality of him flowing through you because of your twisted, unthankful heart. It's dangerous. It's really dangerous, man. Is this making any sense at all? Okay, because I didn't plan on talking about it, so it has to make sense. It does. All right, let me do this Romans 12 thing that I took you to. So Romans 12, 1. People are like, dude, you're out of your mind. No, I'm out of yours. It says, I beseech you, in, in, in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So I beseech you, or I beg of you, or I tell you, this is what is the truth. I, I mean, to me, it's, I beg of you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That means that when I come to God, like when I said yes to God, I came out of, you know, uh, how many people have never heard me before? Oh, there's a lot of you. All of you that didn't hear me, raise your hands again. Wow, you're probably freaked out by now. Okay. It says, I, it says that when I come to God, that, that I'm to be a living sacrifice. That every part of me is offered up to God. So, so man has three parts. It's, it's, it's spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit man, when you, get, when you say yes to Jesus, you get born again. That means being refathered by God. When, when, when you say yes to Jesus, you get refathered. He comes and makes his home inside of you. Your body... It says, may the God of peace sanctify you completely, spirit, soul, and body. So it's three parts. It's in Thessalonians. It's another part of scripture. But when I'm offering my body as a living sacrifice, I'm saying, God, I was in the world, and I've now come into this. Now you're telling me that I'm offering myself. So, so that's why I don't just get people to pray a prayer and say, okay, God, I invite you into my heart. Because Jesus never told me to invite him into my heart. 
He told me to give him my life. Like right there, it didn't say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, to, to offer Jesus just your heart and hold back everything else from him, which is your reasonable service. That's not what he said. So we've, we've made this thing about getting people to invite Jesus into their heart and forgetting that we're supposed to offer up our whole life. So when someone comes into this thing, like, they need to come into this thing and say, you know what, I was living for hell, I was living in a twisted way, my life was totally whacked, you want me? Okay, I will give you all that I am if you show me who you are. And, and man, if you come to God like that, God will say, oh, here I am, bam, boom. He'll land on you and change everything. I'm serious. So when I came to God, I was so whacked, so twisted, so, such a thief, such a destroyer. All I did was hurt, steal, kill, destroy my whole life. Had no idea, never read a book before, had reading disorder, couldn't read, was stoned my whole life, 22 years of drug addiction. You know, grew up in a boy's home, parents gave me up. I joined the Marines to try to straighten out my life. I go to boot camp, I go AWOL after boot camp and run away out to Colorado. I get arrested, I get extradited back across, I get put in the brig. I'm in the brig for a while, I get out, I'm awaiting my orders to get an early discharge, they don't come soon enough, I went AWOL again, went back out, they extradite me back again across the nation in shackles and chains from Colorado to North Carolina where the brig is. So I get kicked out, get a bad conduct discharge, and I am really, really, really not starting out life very well. That does not look good on resumes, all that stuff. My whole life is whacked. I'm jacked, I'm twisted, I'm a destroyer, and I stole from every one of my family members, every one of my, every one of everybody around me. I would come in your house as a salesperson because that's the only job I could have, and I would steal whatever I could and get out of your house as quick as I could. And if you didn't buy my stuff, I had some of your stuff, so it didn't matter. That's really the way that I thought. It was selfish, it was manipulative, it was twisted. And so all that stuff needs to change. And that doesn't just change by me praying a prayer. That, change, that changes by me giving myself completely to this God that loves me. Come on, man. My life was whacked. In and out of prison, in and out of jail. Whacked. My whole life. No Christianity. None in my family were serving Jesus and going after God. None. It was a whack job. My whole life was twisted. And I couldn't stand Christians because all they were to me were hypocrites. Hypocrites. People that said one thing and did another. People that used Jesus as a crutch because they couldn't handle life like I could handle life. <laughs> Jesus isn't a crutch, man. He's like a strong tower. I'm in it. It's awesome. It's different. I'm serious. It's like a strong tower. Like... Stuff comes my way, and I'm in a strong tower, and it doesn't matter. Were you hiding? No, but I am hidden in him, and it's an awesome place to be. And he likes me. He, li he wants to live in me. He's like, I want that one. I'm going to go in there and stay there. Man, that's awesome. That's not crazy. That's, he's crazy about me. He's in love with me. Like, head over heels, man. He's like, I love to live in you, Todd. That's exciting that you're weird. No, I'm real. I'm real. I'm not afraid of this. I'm not ashamed of this. This is all day long, every day. It doesn't matter. Why? Because he loves me. And if you don't, then I'm sorry. I still love you. Come on, man. He was despised and rejected so that I could read my Bible and find out that I have been accepted. If I've been accepted by God, how can you take away what you never gave me? Watch this. If I'm accepted by God, how can you reject me? Well, you don't understand. No, you don't understand. How can you take away my acceptance when you never gave it to me? My father did. So if I'm accepted in the beloved, in my strong tower, I'm accepted in him and I abide in him and I dwell in the secret place of the most high. And I dwell in that place. How can you take it from me? You can't. That's why people will lose their life for the gospel and not deny him because they found this secret, this secret love affair with God. Oh, it's awesome, man. Oh, gee. I'm so serious, man. So my life is whacked and twisted and I, I end up 
meeting some girl on a blind date. We move in together. She thinks I'm some cool dude. I end up tricking her into all kinds of twisted, weird stuff. She thinks, wow, man of my dreams. Man, that was short-lived. A year and a half in, we have a daughter. And I realized I could never be a dad. And I just trashed the reality of what a father should be. And then she wants to leave. And I said, I'll kill you if you ever leave me. I'll kill myself after I'm done. She was more afraid of me killing myself. And she went on for seven and a half years like that. Nine years total. Seven and a half years. My daughter's seven and a half years old, man. All she knows is her dad's a liar, a thief. And my brain is whacked, man. And I've been trained and cultivated by the enemy of this world. Or the God of this world, which is the enemy of God. See, I wasn't just born into sin. I was cultivated. My mind was trained by God's enemy. I was trained by selfishness. I was trained to steal, kill, and destroy as a profession. And people look at me and they say, wow, man, you know, the reason why you're so on fire is because of how twisted you were. And now God came, so now that's why you love so much. And it's so weird because people are giving themselves a reason to not love. Well, you were worse than I am, so you love more. That just sounds dumb. Come on. Well, you know, you were forgiven a lot, so you love a lot. And we scripturally sound that thing. But what we're doing is we're saying, you have the right to love more because you've been forgiven more. But the truth is, is that everybody's been equally forgiven, but not everybody understands that. It says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short. It's equal. All have sinned and all fell short. Period. So that means if I miss one or if I miss them all, I'm equally has fallen short. That's what the Bible says. See, God's holy, man. He's not like, like, we've, he's holy and perfect and beautiful and lovely. And if you miss one law, one commandment, you miss them all. Your whole life's a wash. So in my life, I missed them all. But in your life, if you miss one, you missed them all too. The problem is, is we don't believe how much we've been forgiven, so we don't love. It's the Bible, man. Jesus equally forgave us. How many people revisit where they came out of and wish that they never did what they did? The only reason you do is because you don't understand the power of the blood of Jesus and the finished work and what he really did, or you never look back again. Because Satan's the God of your past. God's the God of your present and future. But you'll never get the present and future if you keep looking in the rearview mirror wondering when that's going to end. Just take it off your thing. <laughs> take the mirror off. Come on, if the shoe fits, take it off. <laughs> so totally whack, totally twisted, and end up like just messing everything up, man. Lots of jobs, lots of sales jobs, quit, got fired from everything, man. Just, I was a con artist, so I could get a sales job, and you only work for commission, so it didn't matter where I worked, so I just kept going and going and going. I was talking the other day about how many jobs I had, and I said 30. No, 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 it was more than that. That's all you can count. All right. Lots of jobs in a very short period of time. So I end up, like, going out one night in the drug deal and picking up some kid, telling him I'm a cop. Tell him he had the right to remain silent. Anything he says can be used against him in a court of law. Ripped him off. Had a quarter ounce of crack in my hand. Told him to get out of the car. And when he did, I hit the gas. And he unloaded a nine millimeter at me from ten feet away. <laughs> and a voice says, I took those bullets for you. Are you ready to live for me yet? You'd be crazy too. <laughs> Three days later, I'm in Teen Challenge. I'm there for two months. I have an encounter with Jesus while I'm in there. I'm cutting my testimony short. I just want you to understand where I came out of and how twisted this thing was. Because there's a lot of work to be done. And that work is, is intimacy. And it's really not hard work, but there's a lot of work to be done. And that work is me getting quiet, believing in the finished work of, of what Jesus did. Resting in his finished work and learning in that place. And growing with him in intimacy. And being renewed the simplicity of the gospel. It's not changed. It's the same. So nine years, like from now, it'll still be the same. It's not going to change because this word never changes. It's the same. It's awesome. I just get more understanding, more wisdom, and I grow in his knowledge so that I can diffuse its fragrance everywhere I go. Come on, man. 
man, it's so good. It's awesome. No matter who I'm in front of, one person. Today, I'm on a plane. I'm on a lot of planes. But uh, I, I went, and, and I went up, and I said, hey, man, how you doing to the attendant? And he's like, I'm good. And I went, wow, that's cool. I said, uh, how's, how's everybody? You know, thanks very much for what you do, because I fly with them all the time, and I always thank my attendants, pray for them and stuff. And, oh, we're doing good. And he said something, and I didn't quite hear what he said. And I said, oh, cool. And I went in the bathroom. I came out, and I went, that wasn't cool. I'm like, I don't even know what, I, dude, I'm so sorry. What did you say? And he started to tell me about, he used another word for layoff. But it wasn't cool. It was about, I went, oh, man, I am so sorry. I didn't hear you right, man. I apologize. He goes, no, it's okay. And I sat there and I poured my heart out and shared with him the reality of where my life was. Kind of like my testimony I'm sharing with you. But I, I shared for about 20 minutes with this guy. And he's just like, wow, man, that's really beautiful. I'm like, yeah, so beautiful, man. It's for you. And he's like, wow. And then I shared the end of it. I, I went that night. I got shot at. Three days later, I went to Teen Challenge. My girlfriend was glad to get rid of me. Hated my guts. She was not a Christian. And I had ruined everything. I went to Teen Challenge. Was there for two months. Had a radical encounter with Jesus. Three nights in a row. Like, just dreams. Dude, just dreams. And the third night, he told me to go home. So I left. Two months two months in, 10 months early, man, which I don't suggest for anybody unless it's a real encounter with God, because you will want to leave. So it better be God. And the fruit that hangs on your tree will bear witness of whether it was or not. Okay. Because a good tree can't bear bad fruit. Bad tree can't bear good fruit. Good trees. Trees of righteousness bearing its fruit unto holiness. Come on, Jesus. You all right? Whether you know it or not, and you're not in your Bible, there's a whole lot of word that's laced in all of this. You won't get out of it. It's really awesome. It is, man. So I come, I come home to tell my daughter how sorry I was. And when I got there, you know, she had no memory of what had happened for seven and a half years in her life. Now listen to this. See, people like to psychologically figure out the word. And, and it's not psychological. It's supernatural. So the blood of Jesus, it says, and I'll probably go over it sometime this weekend, the blood of Jesus cleanses our conscience from dead works in order to serve God. So if my conscience is filled with dead works, that would be my mind, will, emotions, conscience, the place where, it, it's, it's a place where, it's a place that needs to be cleaned by blood. He wipes out my history, doesn't just give me a clean slate, he gives me a blank canvas. Listen, it's really, really good. Like, God's an artist. He's a creator. And he wants to draw on my canvas, man. And I can't afford to have any old drawings in there. And so the blood of Jesus, it's like an eraser, man. He just, whoa, brand new. My daughter had hers erased without even understanding it. So seven and a half years old, I come home and tell her how sorry I was. And she's like, for what, Daddy? I'm like, for all the times that I was up. I mean, her mom kept her up three or four times a week, every, every week. She had to go to school. Like, she'd be up till three hours of sleep to school. Your dad's a loser. I hate your father. I hate this. And, and with, with, outside of the kingdom, I, I get it. Because that's where we were. But that day, she had, that thing had been erased. Like, from day one. I'm like, listen to me. I'm sorry for these things. Daddy, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just glad you're home. I'm like, I'm not home. You need to hear me. Because she was my girlfriend. And for all I knew, it wasn't good. But when she came out of the house, my girl did. She came up to me and she said, I said to her, I said, I'm so sorry. She said, I know you are. When you were in there, I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> now that's nine years of tragedy, man, that I put her through. The, if this thing was psychological, she'd need help. And she would need help unless she found out that the Holy Spirit is a helper. And a comforter. It's awesome, man. Ah. So I look at her and I said, I cannot live here. She goes, I know you can't. We need to be married. Will you marry me? So I'm like, I looked at Dan. I said, we're, we're, we need to plan this, man. Of course I will. We? He said, you're not planning nothing. This is the pastor, my spiritual dad. Way to father me. That's what he said. He said, you're not planning nothing. We're going to do this. Do you love her? I said, absolutely. 
Do you love him? I know you do, because I've been talking to you while he's been in there. And I said, yeah, let's do it. We'll do it on Sunday in between first and second service. (laughs) So we got married on Sunday in between first and second service. (laughs) And that was nine years ago, man. That's like amazing. That's like fairy tale stuff. No, that's so good. That's too good to be true, people say. No, 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 that's so good because God is true. He's truth, man. Like real truth. Nothing but the truth, so help me. Come on. If our court systems make you swear in a Bible. Uh, Okay, so. Sorry. So that's where I came out of. So like I get out, I, I get out of Teen Challenge. I'm like excited. My daughter doesn't remember anything. Like it's a brand, like I'm a brand new dad. Like literally, I am a brand new dad. Like it's just awesome. So I, I go to the church and they have these classes. And, and I'm, get, I'm getting somewhere with this because these two scriptures are where these classes were on. And I'm like, all right. So I went to this church, my home church, and Pastor Dan, he was the associate pastor. And there was a head pastor there. And every Saturday they had a class called Transform, Transformers class. And I would go there. And all they do is talk about Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'm like, huh. This is awesome, because I'm good with one or two scriptures, man. Because remember, I haven't read anything my whole life, man. So I'm good. Like, you can sit in one scripture for a long time, man. You can. So it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, to offer your body as a living sacrifice, a sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is my pleasing, my reasonable service. That's all God's asking. So all God's asking me to give up is everything I am. I mean, that's not much. Think about it. The only thing that this will cost you is God is asking you to give up something you were never created for in the beginning. You were never created for you. You were created for Him. So all He's saying is give up what you were never created to be so you can finally be who I created you to be. That's not much of a cost, man. It cost Jesus a lot. It cost Him His life. So man, you lay down your life and you can't live until you do. This is the bomb and it's exciting and woo! So I'm telling this guy on the plainness, and he's like, wow, that's really beautiful. And I said, man, it's not just an Easter story. It's the gospel. It's the good news. Gospel means good news. It's good news. So I'm sitting there talking to him, and he goes, wow. So I start telling him about some of the miracles that I'm seeing, like, just like, they're every day. So I always have something to say. They're all the time. So I was just in a church we just had lunch and I said we went to this restaurant and I told him about how God see why do we give we give because that's what love does God so loved the world that he gave so when you're like when it's offering time why do we do it because we love I don't give so that I get I give because it's who I am come on man it's weird if you hold on even what you what you have will be taken in the kingdom you give Man, why would you pray for more stuff if you're not even willing to give a little of what you have now? I'm not saying that for your offering. I'm saying that so you can be free from yourself. I mean, heaven gave up everything, went bankrupt to get you back so that you could get free from you. The gospel sets you free from you. Okay. So I go to this restaurant, and I'm sitting there with pastors and some leaders, and our waitress comes up, and I go, hey, how are you today? She goes, I'm doing really good. How are you doing? And I'm down in Georgia. So they're talking like George, like however, I can't do it right, but you know, I love their accents, man. So I'm doing real good, how are you doing? I'm like, I'm doing amazing. God lives in me. <laughs> I'm serious, that's my answer, dude, and I'm sticking to it. It's true, and he'll never take him out of me. He won't. He didn't just say, here I am, now I'm not. Here I am, now I'm not. No, he came to stay. But I have to learn the truth about it, or else I'll live by feelings, and I'll not feel him and think he left me. And then I'm in trouble. Because we don't live by feelings, we live by faith. But if you don't grow in the word, you can't grow in faith. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now that's not faith comes by reading. That's faith comes by hearing. Because when I read, I have to hear. And in order for me to hear, I have to connect. And when I connect, all of a sudden he renews my mind. And I start to think like he does. And it's really cool. You're getting anything out of this at all? I feel like I'm rambling, but um, I really love it. It's awesome. 
So I tell this lady, I'm like, I'm doing really good because God lives in me. She's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Praise God, she says. And she walked away, and, and she goes, I'll be right back. She came back, got her drink orders. I said, I said, I said, is there anything I can pray? No, no, I'm good. Anything I can pray for you? She said, no. She walks away. And then the manager comes up, and I said, hey, how you doing, man? He goes, I'm doing good. How are you doing? I said, I'm doing great. God lives in me. <laughs> I'm not just showing off. I'm by myself. And this is the reality of my life. Yeah. See, whether you're with me or not, he doesn't change. Yeah. I'm not doing this or saying this to show off. I'm just sharing this because of what's available. And I'm just tapping the, I'm just touching the tip of it. <laughs> oh. <sighs> so I said to him, I said, hey, I just want to tell you, that waitress that you got here, she's a very nice lady. She does a great job. Really nice, really polite. Thank you. He goes, oh, well, thank you. We love hearing comments like that. I said, well, it's true. I said, as a matter of fact, I said, here's another one. I said, you're a good manager. I said, you really care about your people. He said, I actually do. I said, you're Christian? He goes, yes, I am. I said, wow. I said, you used to play football? He said, yeah. I said, you played football and you ruined your knees, didn't you? He goes, yeah. <laughs> I said, guess what? That God that lives in me, he just told me. Isn't that cool? He goes, yeah. I said, you know that's available for you? He goes, wow. I said, do me a favor, man. Just let me see your hand. He goes, why? So I got his hand, prayed for him. I said, now squat down, man. Check your knees. Well, they're better. I said, are they on fire right now? He said, they're really warm. What's going on here? I said, God lives in me. <laughs> Just have fun. It's fun. He goes, this is very strange. He goes, I, I, I really needed this. Wow. I said, isn't this awesome, man? He goes, this is really awesome. He goes, would you do me a favor? I said, yeah. He goes, would you be willing to fill a survey out? I said, okay. He said, for corporate. About sir? I said, sure. I mean, to thank, to say the service is good. Not a problem at all. So he goes, all right. He goes, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll be back. So he goes away. She comes back. She goes, she goes, is everything okay? I said, yeah, well, you're not in trouble. Everything's fine. Because he called manager over, you know, all that. So she gets our order. She takes our order out. and She comes back. Um, he comes back again. I said, hey, man. I said, you didn't tell me, but you got a bad back, don't you? He goes, yeah. I said, come here. So he comes over and he goes, well, I said, I'm going to pray for you and Jesus is going to heal you. He goes, okay. But his knees are already healed, so what's he going to say? No, he's not. It's fun. It's the gospel. It's good news. So I prayed for him and Jesus heals him. He touches the floor and hasn't touched the floor in a long time. He's like, I want to tell you something. He goes, I really appreciate you. I said, God really appreciates you, man. I said, he goes, where are you from? I said, I'm from Pennsylvania. Why are you here? I said, I'm speaking at their church. It's going to be fun. He said, I was doing school, actually, their, their school day, like a ministry school. He goes, wow. He goes, I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And shook hands, gave me a hug, and he walked away. The waitress comes back, and she goes, I, she goes, I, I actually, I do need prayer. I said to her, I said, I, right away, I said, you're a single mom, aren't you? She goes, yes, yes, I am. I said, man, I said, I, I need to pray for grace to come upon your life. I said, real grace, God's grace, grace in truth. And, and God's grace is not twisted, it's beautiful. God's grace is the power of God. The, it's not just undeserved favor. It's like Jesus. In Jesus was grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So truth calls us to something that we can never walk out unless grace empowers it to happen. And so what happens is grace and truth come together, and truth is, is opened up by grace. Real grace is the empowerment that we get to walk like Jesus walked. Jesus was the Word, so that means that I really need to understand the Word in my heart, a heart of understanding, spirit of wisdom and revelation, in order for me to walk out what God's called me to be. And so she's like, oh, okay. So we started to talk, and she said, two months ago, I lost my husband. So here she has three kids. Her husband died couple months ago from uh, COPD, horrible stuff. And she's not, she's, she's, you know, she's, she's probably in her late 40s. I'm like, man, I said, come on, let's pray. So we prayed, and she's kind of overwhelmed. And I told her, I just shared with her, see, the will of God is very important, but it has to start with who God is. 
Are you with me? So, so if I don't understand who God is, I'll think that he might be the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. See, if I think that God has anything to do with stealing and killing and destroying, I can't trust him. If I've been taught in my life that God's in control, then everything that happens is God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that God comes to steal, kill, and destroy. It says that God, it says that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. Are you guys with me? Are you? I want to walk around and tap you. <laughs> so seriously, so how can, you, how can you say you love God if you don't trust Him? Because if you think He's a thief at all, you can't trust God. If you think that God came and stole, killed, and destroyed in your life, you can't trust Him because He might steal from you again. Come on, if you think that God's that way, then, then, then you can't really trust Him. How can you pray and have communication and relationship with a God that you think did something horrible to you? You can't. The will of God has to start right there with who God is. God is love, man. So it says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus came to give us life. And I'm talking to this girl, this lady. So listen, I need you to understand something. Disease and sickness never comes from God. Well, see, when someone dies, pastors say what they say to comfort the soul, but sometimes it's at the cost of truth that sets them free. So all of a sudden, she's told a certain thing, well, God knew best, or the Lord needed another angel, or, or hey, it's, hey, listen, that was God's will, or he wouldn't have died from that. So, and that's very, very, very scary, man. Listen, 2,000 years ago, all sickness, all disease, all destruction came from hell. And Jesus proved that because he only came down to do the will of the Father. So everywhere he went, he did the will of the Father. When sick people came to him, he didn't say, this is God, I can't. Sorry. He said, get out. Be healed. The only time when it was even a question of whether it was God's will or not was the, lep was the leper that came to Jesus and said, if you are willing, you can. Jesus didn't say, hold on, let me check, I'm not sure. No, Jesus was the walking will of God. He said, I am willing. Why? Because Jesus only said what the Father was saying and only did what the Father was doing, period. Always, 100% of the time. So that in my life was established as the will of God, period. If I can't see it in Jesus' life, I ought not see it in mine. If I can see it in his life, it's mine. And he says the same things that I do, they're going to do, and greater. That's amazing. So I'm talking to this lady, and I said, listen, God didn't take out your husband. And she's just listening to me, trying to help. I've, I can't tell you how many thousands of people, one-on-one, -on -one, I've talked to about this and watched that whole lie about blaming God get unraveled and ripped off. That needs to be destroyed or you cannot live from heaven. This is big, big, big deal, man. So this lady looks at me and she goes, well, I, I, really, I really believe that God didn't do it. I said, no, God didn't do it nor did he allow it for a reason. This is very, very scary stuff because we use the whole God allowed thing way too much, man. And the devil gets away with murder and we say God let him do it. Come on, listen very carefully to me. If I could just sit on this whole sub this subject right here for days at a time and establish this truth in you, you would be able to trust God. You would look at your life and find out that there's thousands of things that you blame God for that he never did. Then all of a sudden the blame gets off of God and oh, I can... I can actually have a relationship with this one. You see, this is so important because if you think God stole from you, you can't trust him. If you think that he allowed the devil to kill somebody in your life. Oh, I can't. This is like a big one, man. Jesus came down to do the will of God. Jesus said, the food that I have, in John 4, the food that I have is to do the will of him who sent me. He came down only to do God's will. Everywhere he went, he did the will of God. If you can't picture it in Jesus' life, you have to be very careful of what you believe to be God. Because Jesus, like Bill Johnson, I heard him say, has perfect theology. That means that everything you see in Jesus is the Father. Because he came to reveal the Father. 
that I and the Father are one. He came to reveal the Father. And in your life as a Christian, you are here to reveal the Father. It's a big responsibility. But what you believe about the Father is everything because that's the one that you'll reveal. And God is solid and he's, in Him there's no turning or shifting of shadows. He's pure and lovely and holy and beautiful and amazing. And I hear people all the time toss the will of God like a hot potato, man. Well, I don't know the will. I don't know the will. I don't know the will. I don't know the will of God. And it's crazy, silly. It says, don't be conformed to the world. Romans 12, 2. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove or you can approve what the will of God is and what the will of God is not. So it says, don't be conformed to the world. In other words, don't you pick up what you think to be God from the world and from the opinions of other people, but you learn and understand who your father is behind the closed door so that when people ask you, you don't have to question whether this is or this isn't. You will have a divine revelation from the spirit of wisdom and revelation behind the closed door of who God really is. And in every situation, you'll be able to manifest that God in every situation. So this lady just looked at me and said, well, thank you so much. I really needed that. She said she really needed that, but the reality of it is, is I'm glad that I caught her two months into this and stopped it before it got profuse. Because you, I had another lady that was in Switzerland. Are you guys okay with me talking about this? This would be a really good thing to rest on, I promise. If we can get this thing out, man, and you realize that God is good, God is holy, God is love. And he didn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. All he did was come to love you. Yeah. Come to love you. You would have a relationship with that one. And you would have no problems at all. I mean, if you found out that God was love, why would you not want to be fathered by that? Oh, everybody wants to be loved. But God's love is like ridiculous, man. He like loves you and doesn't even need you to love him back for him to feel secure about loving you first. Because he is love. Oh, it's awesome. You can't hurt God because He is love. He's not hurt. He hurts for. Love doesn't get hurt by. Love hurts for. That's different. That means no matter what you do, you can't make me not love you. Well, yeah, well, you don't know what I've been through. You're comparing your life to what you don't understand love is. Come on, man. He'll never turn His back on you. He'll always be there. God's eyes are always on me. He never looks away. He is profusely in love with me. Every day when I look in the mirror, that's what I see. Because <gasps> he lives in me. So when I look in the mirror, I see him staring back at me. I even talk to him sometimes. <laughs> I see you in there. <laughs> sure does beat. Oh, man. Oh, God. Not, oh, not another day. Gosh, man, that's horrible looking in the mirror and not seeing what God sees. You look in the mirror and see what God sees, your day will be amazing. Someone cuts you off in your car, you won't have a charismatic worship service for the devil. <laughs> You'll have a word of encouragement at the stoplight when they think you're going to open your window and fight them. I've had it happen. Sorry, guys, I'm in the middle of a lot of testimonies, but we'll get there. Because life is a testimony. When you see who you are, life becomes a testimony. Everywhere you go, your life is a testimony of what Jesus looks like in flesh. My daughter's in the car with me. Some guy uh, cuts me off, flips me off. We pull up to the stoplight. He's right beside me. My daughter's sitting in the chair. I will out of my daughter's window. This dude's thinking, we're going to fight. What? Hey, man, I just want to tell you that God loves you so much, bro, and he wants to heal your back right now, man. What are you talking about? Man, you got a problem in your back? You heard it at work two years ago. You need healed. I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter if you believe or not. I'm just going to pray for you, and Jesus is going to touch you right now, man. Oh, I promise. That sure does beat, you want some of me? Because really, he wants some of God. But doesn't, why don't you give somebody that? 
instead of your attitude. Come on, man. How? This. You want to know how? This is how right here. This, this is how. I'm at my house. I open my Bible. I open to one of my favorite chapters. Ephesians. I just open to it. I get in my bedroom by myself. And I go in there. I get on my knees. And I look in my word. I can, I can feel him right now. Like I, like I can't say I can, I can. He's with me. It's my love life with God. I just start reading. I say, gosh, grace to me, you said, God, and peace from you, my Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, you have blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. You chose me and you before the foundation of the world. I don't even know how to figure that out. But you thought about me. You knit me in my mama's womb, God. You thought about me. So whether my mom wanted me or not, you did. And that's why you put me there. So all life comes from God. So God, I'm from you and you're my dad. And I love you. And you told me that I'm supposed to be holy and without blame. And walk in love. That you predestined me to be adopted as a son by Jesus. To you. According to the pleasure of your will. It was your will to adopt me. It's your will for me to be holy and blameless. It's your will, God. You called the shots. You created me in your image. You created me in your likeness. God, I thank you that you're creating me every day more and more, and I'm understanding more and more. God, take this mind and renew it. Father, I thank you. This mind is for you. I'm here to represent you. Father, how can I represent you unless you show me who I really am? God, I'm asking you to touch this life. Touch this heart. God, open these eyes and let me see the things that you see. Father, you said to set my mind on things above and not beneath. God, I'm here to represent you. Father, I have a short time period. However long my life is, whether it's 50 years, 100 years, 120 years, 70 years. God, every second of every day, I'm asking you to renew me in the spirit of my mind so that I can understand why I'm here. God, you are love. Teach me what it means to be loved, not to learn how to love. God, help me to never say that I love somebody, but I don't have to like them. Because that's twisted and demonic, and that's not you. Because you don't love me and not like me. You love me. You don't just tolerate me. You are profusely in love with me. Keep teaching me who I am, God, so that I can represent that to the lost and dying world. Because Jesus, you're amazing, and I'm here to represent your name. That's my prayer life, man. You pray like that, and grace will meet you there, and you will become the very thing that you're praying. Grace meets you there. You start to thank God for who you really are. Even if you don't feel like it. It's not about your feelings. If you live by your feelings, you'll live by how you grew up, or how you were touched wrong, or how your uncle, or how your aunt, or how whatever. That's not the gospel. That's tragedy. And God has this good thing that he does. He takes tragedy out, rips that thing out, and puts majesty in. But God's not a thief. He would never come and hurt you. He would never try to, try to squeeze you and push you and, and hurt you. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He comes to push you and squeeze you and mold you. That's why it says don't be conformed to the world. That means pushed in, squeezed in. Molded like the world. Don't be molded like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can walk and prove God's will everywhere you go. And people say, well, I don't think it's the will of God. Well, let me show you. It is. Come on, where's that at? What about this? If you don't believe me through the things that I say, at least believe me through the things that I do, for it's the Father who dwells in me who does it. What's that? That's representing the Father. That's knowing who you are, who you are, where you're going and where you came from. That's the gospel, and it's amazing, man. So I'm, I'm in the restaurant talking to this lady, having an amazing time, loving on her. She walks away. She goes in the back. She's crying a little. The manager comes out. He goes, is everything okay? I said, absolutely okay. I said, you know that she lost her husband, right? 
I said, it's important that she doesn't think that God had anything to do with taking out her husband. I said, if Jesus was here and he had COPD, I guarantee you, he wouldn't say, well, God chose you to die this way. No, he'd say, be healed. That's the will of God. But because we haven't got what we've prayed for, we think we allow that to determine the will of God instead of the life of Jesus Christ. It's true. Man, I've lost people and I don't like it. But if I settle for less than the life of Jesus, I'll lose more. And I refuse to go out that way, man. I'm here to represent his name, to go after this thing, to step out on a limb, to risk it all for the sake of heaven. Because there are a cloud of witnesses. There are people that have died, have been crucified and, and, and burnt at the stake and nailed to trees and heads cut off. They all died. It's called the blood of the martyrs. And that's what this church has been founded on. So I'm going to live my life and I'm going to pour it out. And when the blood of my life is poured out one day, it will bring him glory. And I'm not going to sit there and bow out or be half-hearted in this thing. Either come or go. Either before him or go away from him. Gather or scatter, for or against, choose which side, but run. It's not okay to just sit in your chair and just let other people take it. I love what you said about, about Caleb and about the, the older generation, the younger generation. I'm so tired of hearing people, well, you're Joshua generation. You've just severed yourself. You've severed yourself and you're going to die in the wilderness. And you're not supposed to. We're all supposed to run together. Young and old. Fathers and sons. Together. One. I don't want to hear that other thing because it's not scriptural. It's not biblical. We are in a New Testament that's created everything new. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. We are supposed to carry the torch together. We are supposed to run this race. It's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. It's a race. There's no sprint and marathon about it. We run hard. We run fueled with the, with, the, with the gas of heaven, the grace of God. Fueled that our motor tank never runs out because there's always abundant grace. And you are supposed to reign in this life as a king, Romans 5. Reign in this life as a king through the free gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. That's how you run this race. The abundance, the violent, the excessive amount of grace, and the free gift of righteousness, my right standing, that Jesus paid such a high price to get for me so that I could just give up something I was never created to be so I could finally just become why I'm here. So I can manifest him everywhere I go, not to let other people's thoughts or words intimidate me. I am not intimidated. I will not be intimidated. I don't care if you have a gun in my face. I will not be afraid. Whom shall I fear? And I'm really not kidding you. Love is not afraid. That's a spirit. That's a wrong spirit. It's a spirit of fear. And that's the one that God didn't give me. Because he gave me the spirit of love and power and a sound mind. My mind gets fixed when it gets renewed and it becomes sound and solid. And I set my mind on things above and I start to think from the way that God thinks because he says that I can. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. And if I'm seated there, I need to think from there. I can't think from here towards there. That's hopelessness. I think from heaven towards earth. That's Christ in me, the hope of glory. It's awesome, man. How can you take this away? It's amazing. What a privilege to represent a king of glory. No other God in the world, in the universe. So come on, I want to live inside of you because I think that highly of you. And I want you to represent me so that when people see you, they see me. So this lady, she goes in the back, the manager comes back out, is everything okay? I said, yeah. I said, I just need to straighten some things out, man. She can't blame God for what happened. People always say, God allowed, God allowed, God knows best, God this. We handle the will of God. We don't even know. And God, sooner or later, just becomes the thief, becomes the steal, kill, and destroy. And all of a sudden, when he's done one thing, you will pile 500 things in there. And he's done all this, when really it wasn't him at all. And that snake gets away in the grass. Again, he comes in, fights somebody, and God takes the rap for it, man. Come on. So this lady, she sees it. Thank you so much. I get it. That's it, man. If that's all that happened, that would just be amazing. Because it would start, because she'd go home and tell her kids, you know what, kids? God didn't take your daddy out. 
God received their father, but he's not the one that took him out. You understand? It's different. So she goes back in the back, and she comes back out, and we eat our food and stuff, we're just having fun. She comes out, and I said, hey, I said, uh, I said, can, because the pastors wouldn't let me pay for it. Pastors have a bad habit of paying for everything when you go there. So I usually try to get the bill before I did it to Bill Johnson once, ask him, he'll tell you. He doesn't like that, buddy. In Switzerland, we were there, and I took the bill before he even knew it. It, it takes a lot to get one over on Bill, buddy. Guaranteed. He's just as generous as they come. So I came into the restaurant and I said, hey, by the way, that table I'm going to sit at right now, I got the bill. Don't you dare give it to anybody but me. I'm the one that's going to tip you. <laughs> she goes, okay, sir. She gave me the bill. I paid it. Bill goes, hey, I'll take the bill. She goes, um, he already got it. He goes, how dare you? <laughs> come on, man. He goes, all right, thank you. So... Anyway, she goes back in the back. She rings me up for, I said, can you ring me up for, like, uh, tea? No, we don't have any hot cups to go. Okay, can you ring me up for something for a dollar? You guys want a soda? Nope, we don't want anything. Our pastor friends. We don't want, they don't know what I'm doing. I just want to bless her. She comes back. She goes, I can ring you up for two rolls. I go, okay, that's good enough. She goes, all right, I would just give them to you. No, let me get them. Okay. She comes back. We give her, like, a $250 tip. Oh, dude, listen. I'm not saying that so you can say, wow, that's a lot of money. I'm saying that's radical generosity. She screamed. <laughs> ah! Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. It, it's over. Why? Because it's over. Watch, I just shared with her how God's not the thief, that Satan's the thief. And I'm a representative. I love Jesus. So then we bless her radically. So she thinks, wait a minute, he told me about Jesus and he blessed me. Oh my God. God, you're not a thief. She runs in the back after she hugs me. I can't do this. I can't do this. Oh my God. Oh my God. You don't understand. I say, I do. <laughs> she goes, this is amazing. You're amazing. Oh my God. Thank you so much. She gives everybody a hug at the table. The manager's watching everything. <laughs> How's that for a restaurant? That's fun. So she's like, she goes back in the back, cleans herself up, and we get ready to check out, and we're just having fun. The manager's in the front, she's in the front. They both are giving us all hugs before we leave. So I'm in the plane today, telling this guy about this. And I, I got upgraded, so I'm in the first class section. And I'm telling him and talking to him about Jesus, and the first class people are like, I love it, man. Dude, every opportunity is another opportunity. Every second of every day is another opportunity to manifest Him. Dude, do you know how powerful this is? When you're in a business class section of a plane, and you're around all these business people, and you know already what they do for a living, because your father lives in you, and he talks to you about them. Hey, how you doing? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Hey, I know what you do. Okay, and you tell them, they're like, that is so weird. How'd you know that? I said, because God told me. I said, what do you do? I love people for a living. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, this is really good news. So I'm sharing with the attendant today, and he's like, wow. And I shared about the knees and stuff with the, you know, with the, with the manager and then all the stuff. And I go, hey, man. I said, you hurt your back. You got a problem in the bottom right side of your back? He goes, yeah, I do. He goes, that's weird. I said, no, that's what I've been telling you the whole time. <laughs> I said, what good would it be for me to tell you and not demonstrate it? He goes, wow. Okay, before that, I said, and I started talking to him about Catholicism, about Catholics, and because and we just went with, uh, with Darren Wilson for the next movie. We went and we filmed The Holy Ghost. We went to the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> it was really fun. And I was just telling him the, some of the exciting, just a couple of the exciting things that I'm not supposed to talk about. <laughs> Especially with a microphone. Because it's movie stuff. It's really awesome. W and he's like, well, you know, I used to be a part of the Catholic Church. He goes, but, but something happened and I kind of moved over here. And, and, and he loves to sing. And we're just talking, man, about 
God. And I said, man, have you ever asked God to come and live inside of you? I'm like, why wouldn't you want this in your life? He said, no, I, I haven't. I said, well, come on, man. What do you got to lose? He goes, all right. So we prayed and he got born again. <laughs> why wouldn't you want to? That's awesome. That's like awesome. So I said, now let's fix your back. So we prayed, Jesus heals back. Another guy comes up, and, and he's another attendant. He's wondering why I've got the business attendant up in the front, and he hasn't gotten drinks for the other people, and I'm, I've cornered him. <laughs> we're just having fun. And he, the other guy goes up, he goes, what's going on here? I said, we're praying, man, Jesus is healing him. <laughs> he goes, okay. He goes, when you prayed for me, I felt something go up my arm. I said, that's the Holy Ghost. Isn't that awesome? He goes, that is awesome. I look at the other guy. I go, come on, man. I kind of stepped aside. So I blocked the door. I said, what's going on with you? I said, you're dealing with some stuff, aren't you? He goes, no, I'm good. I said, no, you're not. He goes, well, I got fibromyalgia. I go, no way. I said, come on, man. Let me pray for you. What are you going to do? No. I might make a scene. Well, that's the table's flip right there. <laughs> I don't want you to pray. Why not? Come on. So then we pray for him. He goes, something just went up my arm. I said, he goes, I had tendonitis. He goes, whoa. I said, isn't that awesome? He said, amen. <laughs> He's a Christian. Freaked out because this isn't the time or the place. The time is now. Always now. Let's wait to, no, now. Now. Let me read that verse. It's fun. It's exciting. Oh. I'll just read it. I had another place I wanted to go, but I don't need to. Do, do you understand the will of God when it comes to stealing, killing, and destroying? He doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. If it's not good, it's not God. All good gifts come from the Father of lights. Good gifts. Not bad. Good. God doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. In my left hand, stealing, killing, and destroying. In my right hand, life and life more abundantly. If it's stealing, killing, and destroying, it comes from the devil. If it's life and life more abundantly, it came from your father. Period. There's no God allowed over top of that. Satan's a jerk. He doesn't need permission to attack you. He's a jerk. But it's important that you know who's attacking you. And you don't blame God for that happening. But you stand. And having done all, you stand. And you realize the God that's for you. So that in the midst of trial, you come out with a crisper, sharper, more awesome anointing and awareness of who your father really is in the midst of fire. We'll hit that this week again, okay? But Romans 12, 2 says, don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what God's will is. I want to share one more scripture. Are we all right on time? It's got to tell 12, right? Just kidding. You're all right. You're all night. It'll be my three in the morning. I want to go to Colossians 1. Okay, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Wow. The will of God's all over the Bible. If you just don't think you don't understand it, read your Bible and it'll tell you all about it. Promise. And Timothy, our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ or in Colossa, right, our Coloss. Colossians, it's the book of Colossians, so Col is it Coloss? Colossa, okay, Colossi. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from, the, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Whew. 
because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, and it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard, listen to this, you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. She. As you also heard from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who has declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, I just want to hit this. Since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. I, I, these are like uh, Ephesians and Colossians are two of my most favorite books. I mean, they're easy reads and it's a, there's so much stuff in there. It's, it's outrageous, man. I was on the plane today just reading, loving the word, man, and just loving it. And just, gosh, this is amazing. Oh, gosh. And the more you read it, the more the Holy Spirit will take scriptures that you read before and take them up and he'll link them together and he'll make them go together. And it just, like a puzzle, it'll just go, and it'll just all fit together and it's like, oh, you couldn't really talk about it or explain it, but it's solid and it's in there. And it's what makes you, it's where you think from. It's where you, you get your, your, your basis, your foundation for everything. You'll start to think from the will of God towards every situation. So it's really important. This, this shouldn't be a guessing game. You can't afford to come to church to a conference to come and hear a speaker at the cost of your personal relationship with Jesus behind the closed doors. You can't afford to read a book about the Bible at the cost of knowing the author of the real word. You can't afford because you'll read a hundred books or a thousand books about the Bible but never have a personal relationship with the one that wrote it. The Bible. I, I can't explain to you how important this is, man. For you as the youth, for as a younger generation, to say, you know what? Uh, the miracles are going to happen, because they will. They'll happen, man. You're going to have more in your life. You'll have more words of knowledge, more prophetic. All that stuff will be active. But you can never, ever lose your focus and, and turn away from growing in intimacy and learning who God is through the Word. Yes. Yes. I promise, this isn't legalism. It's, it's real grace. It's grace in truth. It, the truth is the truth. And... The word of God is truth. Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, truly, I say to you, truly, I say to you, Jesus is truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth. The word is the truth, and you can never be steered wrong by it, but you have to get in there, and you have to ask God, say, renew my mind. God, I'm asking you to fix this thing, because this thing needs to think from this. It needs to think from, from the reality of who you created me to be, and your word speaks to me. God, teach me who I am. Read it, and don't read it to teach. Read it so you understand who you are. Don't read your Bible to teach people. Don't read your Bible so you have something cool to say. Read your Bible and say, God, I need to get this in me. Still today, nine years in, I read my Bible and I say, God, I'll be in the morning or, or on the plane. God, thank you so much. I'm going to open your word today. Father, I'm asking you to speak to my heart, God. I'm asking you to shine light, God, in my life. Father, that everything that comes out of my mouth is like a machine gun of truth, God. I thank you that you will completely overwhelm me with your goodness today. Teach me who you are, God. Every day, all the time. Never, ever let that thing escape from you. Because the will of God is not for sale. It's in here. And it's amazing. So it says... Which has come to you, it's all the world, and it's bringing forth fruit. It's also since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Ep Epaphras, I'm going back into seven, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who has declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. So listen, Paul didn't just go to get new converts after a convert was converted and gave their whole life, their whole body as a living sacrifice to God. Paul held on and said, I am praying for you so that you can be filled with the reality of the knowledge of his will and spiritual understanding of everything that God has. Why? So that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's real grace, man. Grace isn't a license to just do whatever you want. Grace, isn't, grace doesn't just say, hey, man, 
I can do what I want. Back off, I'm under grace. And say, you're a legalist. No, that's twisted. See, Jesus never, ever, ever walked in grace and sinned and tried to get away with it and called it grace. That's not grace. That's demonic. It's actually something that's out there right now. And be very careful because it's very, very appealing. Well, I can incorporate Jesus' sin, call it grace, do what I want in his name. It's all good. Oh, it's, it's whacked. It makes divorce okay. Hey, we just weren't meant for each other. Hey, back off. I'm under grace. Who are you to judge me? And we use that kind of trash. Guaranteed that would never have gone over when Jesus walked. Promise. Ever. That's not grace. That's demonic doctrine inspired by hell to make the church look just like the world. It says, don't be conformed to the world. That's what grace is. Twisted grace is, the conform is conforming to the world and incorporating Jesus in. Actually, it's taking Jesus' face and raking it through the mud, saying, this is Jesus. And I'm not being mean. I'm being real. Because I promise you, God loves you. But God demands change. He demands change, and it's only by grace that it happens. But grace is the empowerment of heaven. So important to get in that word and read it. He says to walk worthy of the calling. What does that mean? Wow. When people see you, do they see Jesus? This is amazing, man. It's awesome. I travel the world, and champions are being taken out and twisted up in this weird thing. Last time I was here in your city, I was with Ben Dixon. I was getting picked up in the morning before that conference at a hotel here. And I went out front, and there was a guy there. And I said, hey, man, how you doing? He's in your city. I said, I'm doing great, man. How you doing? He goes, hey, man, you need a script? I said, what do you mean, a script? He said, dude, a prescription. I said, dude, I was a drug addict for 22 years, man. I'm free. He looks at me, he goes, oh, man. He goes, are you a Jesus freak? I said, absolutely, man. He looks at me, and he goes, so am I. He goes, here's my card. He gave me a card of a church called Holy Smoke. He prescribes marijuana licenses for all of his members in your town. That ain't grace, man. Why would Jesus bring me out of that in order for me to have a license to it now? I'm not being mean. I'm telling you, man. Why would you... Why would you want to go back into that, that you could be free from it, not even have a pull? Dude, I was a drug addict my whole life. Jesus came in. I have never been tempted to use drugs or alcohol since day one. When I came out of Teen Challenge, my house was full of pornography stuff. My house was littered with it all through. I had all kinds of stuff. I'm on the porch, and we decide we're going to get married. And I said to my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, I said, can you do me a favor? Can you watch Destiny? I need to go in there and take care of some things. My heart beat with this conscience that was clean, that was violated just by the thought of my little daughter finding the stuff that I didn't even think was wrong. And now I know it's wrong because I have a relationship with truth. Grace is making my heart go like this. Get it out of there, son. Get it out of there now. And my heart's beating. It's called righteousness. It's having my senses trained to discern between what's good and what's evil. It's biblical, solid foundation stuff that's awesome. And I said to her, you got to let me do it. So I went through the house, and God enabled me to go through every nook and cranny of my house. Every bong, every bowl, every bag, all my roaches that I saved for a bad day. All my pornography, all my DVDs, all my stuff, man. He enabled me to clean sweep room through the house. The Holy Spirit, you don't forget over here. Don't forget over here. What, back there. My heart beating the whole time. Not because I'm guilty. Because conviction is rolling through me, man. Real grace brings real conviction. Real conviction brings real change. Real Holy Spirit brings real God-like traits. And I swept through the house and I took it out back in a big trash bag, man. My wife is probably watching this right now. She remembers the day. I took it out back and I took a sledgehammer and I smashed it all. By myself in the trash barrel. Bam, 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 bam. I went in the, in the garage, got some gasoline. Poured it all over there. Poured a trail out. I really did. 
I promise. <laughs> Listen to me. It's very important, man. It says if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. I'm gouging it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. I'm cutting it off. That's not legalism. That's holiness. It's holiness. So, woo, you Mr. Holy? No. I'm God's man. I go, and I worship Jesus by the fire as all my junk burned. And I put a death to it all. That's grace. And then if something comes, something comes up and I'm walking along my life. See, I had that thing in my life, man, where it was twisted, where, I, I, you know, the, the, just the, the way we grow up. If you're a guy, you get the pretty girl, if you're a man. That thing is not from God. That's demonic. That's not God. That's the devil. If you came here, boyfriend, girlfriends, I hope you get convicted by this thing. The conference will be small tomorrow, brother. Good, I hope you're at home going, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. <laughs> Living this, man, I love it. It's good. It's good for your heart. It's beautiful. Purity. It says flee from youthful lust. Flee from it. Flee from it. Run away from it. So I run and see, watch this. If I'm in the strong tower and I abide in him, I no longer have to run away from it because I've run into him. And I live in that place, in that secret place, and I seek my father who's in secret. It's my prayer life. It's in Matthew 6. It's so beautiful. I seek my father in secret. God, I need to become like you. I need to be who you created me to be. Father, I thank you so much. You're my God. And I'm your son. Teach me who I really am. And you grow in that place. Why would you not want that in your life? It's available. It's real grace. It's real, real beautiful stuff. It's a love relationship where I can be in love with my father on a constant basis. That whole pornography thing, not even crept. Job 31.1 says, I made a covenant with my eyes to not look lustfully upon a woman. What if that's real? What if you could actually make a covenant with your eyes? And then since God is a covenant-keeping God, what if he'd grace and empower you to keep that covenant of truth with your eyes alive? So that even the thought made your heart tremble because you knew it was wrong. And then you said, God, I thank you that was wrong. Father, you're amazing. Thank you for who you created me to be. What if your life looked like that? Because that's what my looks like. I'm not just preaching at you, telling you what might be possible. I'm telling you what is possible. This is the reality of the gospel that you said yes to. And if you didn't, why would you not want to? I'm sorry if it's been messed up and you've seen different gospels. But this is real. This is alive. This is Jesus, man. He's enabled you to live like this. Why would you not want it? 